Hi, I'm Rick Thigpen. At Public Service, we believe all citizens need to be informed about the important economic and environmental issues that affect their communities. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this edition of State of Affairs with Steve Adubato has been provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, PSENG, committed to providing safe, reliable energy now and in the future. United Airlines, RWJ Barnabas Health, TD Bank, Berkeley College, and by Summit Medical Group, a multi-specialty medical practice providing comprehensive care from birth and pediatrics to geriatric care, concentrating in general wellness, cancer treatment, disease management, and behavioral health. Promotional support provided by AM970, The Answer, and by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. Welcome to State of Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato. We're coming to you from the Agnes Varis NJ TV studio in downtown Newark, New Jersey. It is our honor once again to introduce our friend John Sarno, President, Employers Association of New Jersey. John, real quick uh, recap. Your association represents whom? Well, we uh, are comprised of over uh, 3,500 employers, and uh, we help good employers be better. Uh, through uh, education, training, counsel, and uh, benefit plans. Tim, we're talking right before we got in there, and you said this has been one of the most aggressive agendas going all the way back to the 1930s when it comes to worker protection in New Jersey. What think, do you mean? What does that mean? Well, I think that's right. Uh, uh, it's been a very progressive, uh, aggressive agenda from the New Jersey legislature and the governor. And uh, quite frankly, there's been probably two decades of built-up demand for... Uh, uh, minimum wage increases. So increasing for, to fifteen dollars an hour over a period of years, that's a big deal. Uh, it's it's clearly a big deal. A big. Uh, it's uh, definitely a big uh, impact item. Uh, earned sick leave. Uh, what does that mean for people? Earned sick leave. Well, there are um, tens of thousands of New Jerseyans who um, are balancing work and family, who are unable to take leaves of absences from their employers. And uh, either they're, uh, they're, they're choosing between their job or, or their family demands. And um, if they do get the leave, they're not going to be compensated for it. And so now there's a longer period of time that you can be compensated. That's correct. So from six weeks to 12 weeks. And also the people in your orbit, in your family, in your world, who are now have a problem or are sick and you are caring for them has expanded. Uh, siblings, parents, grandparents, and also families of choice, uh, folks who um, are the equivalent of family members. Right. And, of course, um, time off to take care of your own medical condition as well. So um, and about equal pay for equal work, talk about that, because I, I, uh, employers are prohibited from offering lower pay and benefits to workers in protected classes, such as women minorities. Break that down. Yeah, I think this is the uh, potential game changer because this amends the New Jersey law against discrimination. It creates a private right of action, which is a lawsuit, a jury trial, treble damages, and it really puts a, um, uh, a, a very strategic focus on how people are paid. Very small businesses are kind of idiosyncratic, very reactive. They're, 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 they're very unstructured on how they pay people. Some of it is based on very subjective reasons. I think going forward, this could be the big game changer. Well, game changer in what way? Are you saying that well, there are certain kinds of businesses who aren't going to be able to handle this? Well, uh, on average, women uh, make about 80 cents in New Jersey for every dollar a man makes. So, I mean, there's multiple... And we agree that's not fair. Well, but there's multiple reasons for that. I mean, there's demographic reasons, there are cultural reasons. Not all of that can be explained as job discrimination, but, but some of it can. And when you're looking at jobs, right, you, you have to make an effort to determine what's an equivalent job and to uh, reach a, uh, a, a, a or achieve a pay equity. 
and quite frankly, not many businesses are equipped or sophisticated enough to do that. So. The, the, the question is, is how, how transformative this will be over time. You know, it's so interesting, John, as you talk about this. By the way, let me say that John is one of the uh, group of uh, folks who help support what we're doing here um, on state of affairs and other public policy programs um, with his organization. But I'm curious about something as you talk about this. You seem to be saying that even with the best intentions, it's hard to pull this off. Well, it requires resources, right? Because, um, you know, HR most... HR resources, legal yeah. resources. Uh, compensation resources, particularly with equal pay. I mm. mean, that's one of the pieces of, of advice I give to a small business owner is be, be less uh, subjective and have a resource you can, you can refer to uh, just to be able to show that you're acting in mm. good faith and uh, not intentionally discriminating. You know, I'm curious about this. Uh, our sister series... Think Tank tries to look at some national issues and talks to people in this region about those national issues and trends. To what degree, John Sarno, does what we're talking about and these changes, this very progressive agenda regarding quote unquote worker protection potentially impact the relationship, I shouldn't do it like that, but potentially the relationship between employers and employees? Well, it's enormous, and it's very dynamic. And if you're looking at context, there's a... There's this is across a, there's the nation, a, too. I want to be clear. There's a global context, and it's driven by demographics, right? So if you look at, you know, family leave, look at our, look, look at our labor pool, look at our workforce. Uh, working parents, many single parents who are caring for children, uh, who are caring for uh, older parents. So, you know, I mean, it's no coincidence that we have this remedial legislation at this time because it's driven by a huge demographic force that um, goes beyond just New Jersey. Um, family leave is also the care for a newborn, right? right? There are 300 babies born in New Jersey every day, uh, mostly to working parents. So what is uh, it, does it create potentially more tension between employers and employees because <laughs> while they all want to be awesome. supportive of each other in theory, their agendas don't match up. Well, it's a great question because not every business is an employer, right? An what do you mean by that? You said that to me before. I said, yes. so you represent businesses. You said, no, I represent employers. Correct. What's the difference? Employers compete on talent and businesses compete on price. Employers invest in their people because they're looking to tap innovation and, and drive the product line. A business tends to treat employees or workers as interchangeable and therefore tend to uh, race to the bottom. So, you know, we're looking at two separate classes of business slash employers in New Jersey. Uh, I think employers are going to be able to get this right because they've already gotten the mind site. They've already invested in the human resources. It's really the, the businesses and the small businesses that are really viewing this as a, um, uh, as a uh, interference in their ability to, 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 to manage this. And the things. time we have left, uh, you've often talked to me offline about the fact that there are certain things we're not doing, could be doing, should be doing, whether it relates to health care costs or whatever. One thing that's not on the agenda right now or should be higher up on the agenda that would help improve the relationship between employers and employees is? Well, it's, it's really about um, health care, uh, clearly. Co cost still exponentially out of control. With, 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 with that, without a doubt, without a doubt. And uh, ACA goes away, the Trump administration is talking about it, say it goes to the courts, it goes away, good, bad, what? Well, um, we're here, we're along, in New Jersey, we're gonna do, we're gonna do our own thing. I mean, we're-, right. we're the governor we, said we're doing our own thing. Right. Uh, we, we have a market uh, that is still uh, unable to provide affordable care. Uh, it's, it's a work in progress. Employers, it, I mean, most of us get our, our health care through an employer-sponsored plan. So unless you can figure out a way to make those prices affordable, uh, then um, you're, you're, you're looking at a, a real major problem going forward. I just want to make clear, you talk to employers every single day about every these day. issues. Every day. Myself, my staff, every single day. And deal with them from a very practical versus a theoretical or abstract point of view. In the trenches. Bottom line, trying to make budget, trying to do what you got to do. Right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, clearly, uh, again, going back to demographics, you have people who have medical conditions, people who are raising families, yet they are still... Employees that we count on every single day. John Sarno is president of the Employers Association of New Jersey. I want to thank you for joining us here on State of Affairs. We appreciate Pleasure. it. Well done. Thank you. I'm Steve Adubato. This is State of Affairs. We're at NJTV. We'll be right back right after this. 
To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, Ph.D. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Eric Knaff is uh, Chief Executive Officer of Suez North America. Good to see you, Eric. Good to see you, Steve. Thank For you. For those, those who don't know what Suez is, tell us. So Suez is a uh, public utility. We are servicing uh, population you know, around the world, actually, in uh, drinking water and wastewater. And there are many communities in the state of New Jersey that you service. Uh, Hoboken, Jersey City, Bayonne, uh, Hackensack, et cetera, et cetera, many. Absolutely. Long-term partnership, and we've been servicing those communities for a very, very long time. Absolutely. And very proud of it. Let's uh, also clarify, for full disclosure purposes, Suez is one of the underwriters of, of our programming, particularly around um, environmental issues. That being said, Eric, help us understand something. Someone turns on the tap. They go, whether in one of these communities, right? Geez, there's lead in my uh, this water. It must be the company that provides the water to my home or my school or my business. Help us understand what goes on in those pipes that aren't that new. But Steve, you know, everyone, and I'm sure you and I are no different, you know, we all take uh, water for granted. But certainly it's not always been the case. And in the particular issue that you were referring to, lead can leach uh, in, in water. And leach, explain what leach, leach. means. So lead can be dissolved in, in water coming essentially from lead pipes, lead features that you can have in your, in your home. But, you know, Suez, the water that leaves our plant is absolutely lead-free. So there's no lead in the water leaving the plant. So whenever there's lead, that lead could be coming from the service line that is servicing your home. So service line, you know, just in, in layman term, that's the line from the main, the water main, going to your house. But, you know, we, we've talked about, we talked about this last year. We started the discussion. And there have been many more communities that have experienced challenges in this way. If there was an honest discussion, I asked you that again. I'm going to try it this time. If there was a truly honest discussion about what it would cost to upgrade, I know the word infrastructure is one that not a lot of people want to use, but the infrastructure around how we get our water, a real honest discussion about what it would cost, in New Jersey, forget about the country, that's a much larger question. Yeah. What are we talking about? Uh, look, Is before, it billions? It's billions. And, and Governor Murphy, you know, has very publicly uh, stated that uh, the infrastructures of New Jersey need major attention. And by the way, it's not just New Jersey. So uh, It's across know, it's, the country. It, it's across the country. Well, people me, know it Flint and other places. Even, you know, that's, that's not this. No, I mean, the, the, the situation in New Jersey is uh, not comparable with the Flint situation. Ours is, ours is infrastructure related. Correct. And let me give you a few stats, you know, just to give you the uh, sure. magnitude of the problem uh, nationwide. Every year in this country, 250,000 main breaks. Every year, as a result, 7 trillion, with a T, 7 trillion gallon of water lost as a result. Define one trillion lost. Eric, define lost. Gone, you know, going in the uh, lost for public consumption, wasted, you know, uh, seeping in, in the uh, environment. So that's a daunting crisis, and there's no easy solution. So let me tell you, Steve, you know, what really is necessary. You know, there's no magic solution, but leadership and political will is going to be what will solve, essentially. Describe that what that looks like. Political will is the will to look at not just the cost, but the will to make an investment in infrastructure for the future of our communities. That's very critical. Well, let me push back. What about if that means, and I guess this is the part where political will and courage come in. Someone says, you know what? We need to upgrade our water infrastructure. And it's going to require that we have a dedicated tax to do this. I mean, there's a gas tax, as you know, that supports um, the Transportation Trust Fund for long-term transportation projects. I'm not, could, could there theoretically be an initiative that supports long-term water infrastructure projects, but is supported by quote-unquote a tax? You know, there should be, there's no question, Steve, that our infrastructure need repair. It, there's a need. 
There's a need. So no one, you know, is going to deny <laughs> to anybody. If you're asking anyone, is there a need? There's a need. Not debatable. Not debatable. The solution, you know, there's nothing, you know, there's not a one size fit all kind of solution. And I will tell you what Suez has done. So we've, we've in, in the communities that we serve, we, are, we have invested uh, a lot, you know, in uh, upgrading the network, upgrading the plant, but not just that. We've also invested, because, you know, investing dollars, I would not say is easy, but that's, that's a common solution. We've invested in smart solutions. For so example? Smart solutions being, you know, we are making sure that the dollar we spend are actually the dollar that needs to be spent. So just give you an example, you know, in the old days, you would say, you know, I need to replace X mile of pipes per year in that community. Nowadays, you know, we say we still need to replace uh, pipes in the community, but we are going to use artificial intelligence software to tell us predictively where the breaks are going to occur. So we are going to replace those pipes that are most vulnerable. So we're using the same dollar, but just more efficiently. So it's interesting. We're doing a series on, on innovation in the state. Is what you just described an example of innovation working to do what? To serve our customers better and to use, to make sure we don't waste money and uh, that we communicate with the communities and the customers a lot more efficiently. So it's efficiency. I'm sorry for interrupting, Eric. But you know what's interesting about that? People will often measure the what they perceive the effectiveness of what you're doing based purely on the dollars you spend. You're saying it's not that black and white. No, and it's not the only KPI that you should look at. You know, how you interact with your customers, you know, for conservation program, for example, is absolutely critical. And again, smart tools, digital tools, interacting more efficiently with customers on a custom tailored basis, if I may use that analogy. You know, it's not just, oh, you know, you're uh, Mr. X living on that particular community. We know, nowadays we know the cons your water consumptions and uh, we have program to, to fine tune the conservation program that, uh, you know, will be the most effective for you. Final question. A lot of folks, you can, you can look at a lot of uh, public affairs, public policy, political programs, whatever you want to call them. You will not find a lot of discussions about water, right? Which is one of the reasons why we wanted to look at this. Because there's often a perceived crisis in a community or a crisis, and people say, oh, let's deal with water. And then the crisis is resolved or whatever, and we go on to the next thing. How important is it that there is a national discussion, debate, serious dialogue about our water future. Steve, I think collectively, we have failed to invest enough in our infrastructure. So yes, there should be a national discussions about water. And again, the situation is not the same. If you look at the east, you know, here, there's plenty of, of rain. So water scarcity is not an issue. If you look at the west, California, Nevada, Arizona, there's not enough water to support you know, uh, the development of communities. So water scarcity, water reuse is, a, is an issue. So again, you know, that needs to be uh, discussed you know, very holistically. And here in the East, I did mention you know, we have conservation program. That is important. And right. it makes sure we don't build infrastructure that we don't need. Eric, I want to thank you for joining us. I promise it will not be the last time we talk about the water, the challenges we have, and how important it is in our life, and that we should never take uh, clean water for granted. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Steve. Well done. Appreciate it. I'm Steve Adubato. This is State of Affairs, and we'll be right back right after this. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Welcome by Christian Fuscarino, who is Executive Director of Garden State Equity, which is? New Jersey's largest LGBTQ organization. Oh, Christian, you've been with us many times, and I appreciate that. Listen, historic times in New Jersey. Let's talk about the curriculum changes uh, about LGBT history in New Jersey. What is happening, and when is it happening? So all New Jersey students will now learn about LGBTQ history in schools. We're the second state in the nation to pass such a law, but we're the first state in the nation that will teach LGBTQ history 
in all subject matters from English to social studies. And this is important because LGBTQ youth should see themselves represented in history. Mm -hmm. There's this you know, terrible story of having LGBTQ people be silent throughout their lives and hiding their identity. And it's time that we can let young people know that they exist and they made contribution, contributions to our society. Two quick points. Uh, one, Len Dio, you know, he is founder and president of New Jersey Family Policy Council, said, you know what, that a person made a contribution to society, good for them. Do we have to extol their sexual orientation or what they did? They didn't accomplish something because of their sexual orientation, you say? Well, Steve, you made Len sound articulate. Unfortunately, for people that oppose this bill, they don't By the way, understand. Now we're going to have to get Len on here to be <laughs> articulate for himself. So go ahead. Um, for people that oppose this law, they just don't understand that when we're talking about historical icons, we often talk about their partners. So we are saying that people in our history are straight by mm. mentioning that George Washington had a wife named Martha. Okay, that means that George Washington's straight. We need to make sure that uh, historical figures that happen to have a same sex partner. We have to make sure that's included in history, and that's what counts. Yesterday, there was an announcement. There is a gentleman running for president, the mayor of, help me on this? South Bend, Indiana. South Bend, Indiana, population 100,000. First candidate, if I'm not mistaken, in a legitimate campaign for the Democratic nomination to say, my partner, my male partner, my husband, and I uh, are very close, and he's helped me through a lot of things. And Mike Pence said, you know, God wouldn't be happy with you. And the mayor turned back and said, really? Don't blame me. Blame my creator, you say? Well, we love Pete Buttigieg. And, and That's who it is. Yeah, and then we're supporting him, uh, or I'm supporting him for president, because not only is he LGBTQ, but he has a lot of experience from serving in the military to running a small town in America that has made a comeback to making sure that um, the people are represented. Uh, and he's a millennial, so he has new innovative ideas, and I'm very happy to see that he's well, running. What could this mean? I mean, people are saying, yeah, he could do well in Iowa, and I don't, we don't do uh, national politics too much, but in the South, those primaries down there, the Carolinas, do you think a fair number of people, a significant number of people will say, I just want to know what he thinks, as opposed to what they think his sexual orientation is? Well. Pete Buttigieg has made very clear where he stands on policies and where his experience lies. Um, he talks a lot about his service in uh, the Afghanistan war, where mm. he has more military experience than most recent presidents. And Including so, this president, who, if I'm not mistaken, had some problems with his feet that did not allow him to serve in the Vietnam War. Yeah, our current president didn't serve because he had bone spurs. Um, so he has no military experience, and the that's Secret just a Sec fact. That's not any criticism. No. It's just a fact. Go and ahead. and the uh, Secretary of, of Defense, uh, who Trump appointed, has no military experience and either. And Mike Pence. And Mike Pence's son serves in the Marines. My partner also serves in the Marines. So I'd like to believe that Mike Pence has some idea of what sure. sacrifice means for our service members. Is this? I don't want to get too caught up in this. Is this a critical moment in our nation's history in this regard, with, with the mayor running? I think it's. I think what's great about the lineup of folks that are running for president is that they're from very diverse backgrounds mm -hmm. and they really represent the fabric of America. Let's bring it back to New Jersey. There's an initiative uh, that the folks over at Horizon told us about that you're aware of and involved in, uh, the foundation there. It's called Map and Expand. What does it mean and what does it mean in terms of health care? Yeah, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey has been a great supporter of this project. Right now, LGBTQ New Jerseyans are traveling into New York City or Philadelphia to find the care and services they critically need. And here at Garden State Equality, we're working with providers such as RWJ Barnabas on establishing trainings that will help make providers more competent in LGBTQ healthcare. Then what we're going to do is map them on a website so LGBTQ people can go onto this website and see where there are providers in our own state where they can find these services. Is there a cultural sensitivity component to this? Absolutely, yeah. There's, there's trainings um, around uh, diversity and cultural sensitivity, and also there's certain procedures that surgeons need mm -hmm. to be um, knowledgeable in. And so uh, we, you know, we handle the more... Um, LGBT 101 training, and mm. RWJ Barnabas is investing in making sure that we have surgeons here in New Jersey that can perform LGBT-specific types. Let, let me shift yeah. gears again to a more uh, national social issue. New gender options uh, having to do with flying. Mm. Can you talk about that? 
Sure. I mean, anytime someone boards on an airplane, they want to get from point A to point B. They shouldn't have to prove their gender at the gate. So mm -hmm. any of the airlines that are changing policies to make sure that transgender people can fly in a seamless way where they don't need to worry about their gender being exposed, I think is an important step forward. And that's happening with United, isn't it? Yeah, United was the first airline to Please make this. Please tell me there are others. We hope that others will follow in United's footsteps. Um, let me ask you this. Final question. We've talked to you several times. How much progress in the last three to five years do you think we've made in terms of um, the LGBTQ agenda and the rest of us being aware and sensitive to it? A few seconds. Well, in big part, thanks to Governor Murphy, New Jersey's leading the way on LGBTQ issues across the nation. And so I think that for our residents that identify that way and folks that support them, New Jersey's in a much better place than it was four or five years ago. Thank you, Christian. Appreciate it. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Um, this is Steve Adubato. This is State of Affairs. By the way, real quick, I just want to qualify this. The United is an underwriter of public broadcasting, what we do. Check you out next week. Thanks so much. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 30 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of State of Affairs with Steve Adubato has been provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, PSCNG, United Airlines, RWJ Barnabas Health, TD Bank, Berkeley College, and by Summit Medical Group. PSENG is building New Jersey's clean energy future. We're working to protect our network against extreme weather, expanding and upgrading transmission lines, and modernizing our natural gas system by installing new, more durable underground pipes. At PSENG, our goal is to make sure you have the safe, reliable energy you need to power your life now and into the future.